So welcome to our event this evening, which is co-sponsored by the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination and Cures, which is the Center for Urban Resilience. I want to first uh, extend some thanks to other people besides our speaker who have helped to make tonight possible. First, uh, thank you to our president and our provost, whose support for ACTI has been unflagging over the past year and who have resourced us so that we could bring you important events like this. Uh, as well, Dean Crabtee and Dean Chobe of the Seaver College and of the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts, um, who also have been large supporters of the programming this past year uh, and of Cures and ACTI more generally. Eric Strauss, who's the director for Cures, had a uh, sort of urgent and unexpected event to deal with tonight, and so he's unable to join us, but he sends his regards and his hopes that this is a fruitful evening and fruitful discussion for all of us. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, Stephanie Monson, especially, without whom none of the events in this series would have happened, uh, and John and Rory, who are our graduate Reigns assistants and help everything run over at ACTI. The Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination is focused on engaging the full richness of the Catholic intellectual tradition in all of its diversity. This means, and there's a lot of different ways we could talk about it, but I think this means, one, addressing themes of significance to the Catholic intellectual tradition conceived broadly, and two, thinking of those themes and issues with an intellectually serious interdisciplinary lens, and doing so by engaging diverse perspectives on those themes and issues, religious and lay, Catholic and non-Catholic, as articulated by the best scholars and thinkers of our time. Tonight's talk is the culmination of a year-long reflection on Laudato Si, Pope Francis's environmental encyclical. This was really a great gift to ACTI this past year as we thought about ways that we could engage ideas that were important to the Catholic intellectual tradition, that were interdisciplinary and could draw people from all across campus, and that required uh, serious thinking because there are urgent issues for our time. And to have this encyclical sort of dropped in our lap this year was, was a, a great gift for organizing the initial events for the Academy. Um, this encyclical focuses on climate change, social justice, economic justice, uh, and theology. Our year-long reflection on it began with a faculty roundtable in the fall of 2015. Some of those participants are here this evening. And followed up this semester with a talk by Jeremy Powell, who was on the 2007 Nobel Prize winning IPCC. A film screening of This Changes Everything, the movie based on Naomi Klein's book of the same name, and then a talk by Naomi Klein herself most recently. Tonight is the culmination of this, this series, and it really brings together everything we've been thinking about talking about climate change and talking about Laudato Si from an academic perspective, from the scientific perspective with Dr. Powell, from this activist perspective uh, and issue of economic justice with Naomi Klein. Uh, our guest tonight, Father Sean McDonough, is uh, really going to bring this together, I think, in a way that makes sense for the sponsorship of the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination, and will be able to give us insight into the framing of this document and its significance for the Catholic intellectual tradition. Father McDonough is a member of the Irish region of the Columban Missionary Priests and one of the many experts that Pope Francis consulted while shaping his environmental encyclical on the care for our common home, Laudato Si. He's an internationally recognized eco-theologian, author, lecturer, and consultant to Catholic Church leadership, the World Council of Churches, governments, and civil society organizations. He works to raise awareness on the connections between justice and peace issues, environmental sustainability, and faith. And he's an outspoken critic of policies that allow for the systematic degradation of the environment, linking them to global poverty and to the increased suffering of the poor. Father McDonough is the author of numerous articles and 11 books and volumes, some of which you can see at our, our book exhibit in the back there uh, once the talk is done. The titles of his books include Climate Change, The Challenge to All of Us, Dying for Water, A Passion for the Earth, Greening the Church, and to care for the earth. Given this expertise, Father McDonough was an advisor to Pope Francis during the drafting of Laudato Si, and that's why he's with us here this evening. His presentation tonight is entitled Laudato Si, a prophetic challenge for the 21st century. Please join me in welcoming Father Sean McDonough. <laughs>
So thank you very much for inviting me to this hall this evening to present this presentation on uh, Laudato Si, in my estimation, probably one of the most important social encyclicals ever written. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the Jesuit community, particularly Father Alan Dick, for their wonderful hospitality to me since I came here last Saturday evening. Uh, also to yourself, Brian, uh, you met me at the airport, and also to Stephanie, who was, again, uh, very hospitable for my, during my time here. And today I took a little time out with two of my own Columbans, uh, Father Tim Mulroy here, my superior in the, in the United States, and Father John Brannigan. So let us start on this ex extraordinary encyclical. I, mean, I make the point, and I will hopefully uh, clarify this, that in, in this encyclical, the Catholic Church has gone from about being kinder or pre-kinder in terms of our understanding of the environment, uh, the magnitude of the issue, the urgency, and the theological dimensions of this. And we've gone to at least graduate study. So it's an extraordinary gift to the church, and we very badly needed it at the time. So it's an encyclical on the environment, on economic issues, a lot of environmental issues. Uh, for example, uh, biodiversity receives a huge, and it's the first time in Catholic social teaching, apart from one paragraph, as we will see, in the compendium of the social teaching of the church. I mean, it seems unbelievable that a church that's supposedly pro-life wouldn't have taken on board the reality of biodiversity and its extraordinary destruction, 100,000 species every year. So we, we start with the, the words of, of St. Francis in Umbrian, uh, pre-Italian, uh, and the Pope decided this was the basis, this was the, the name of the encyclical, care for the earth, care for other human beings. Uh, it was wonderful that he did the, in this Umbrian world because I suppose if Francis hadn't written this, uh, Dante wouldn't been, have been able to write the Commedia uh, in Italian just over a hundred years later. So it was a great gift to us, a great gift of understanding this community, as we will see, of creation. Uh, what Francis does and brings to our understanding of life, he brings the idea of family. Everything is family. Brother fire, sister moon, mother earth. And for uh, an understanding of a thousand years of Augustinian and Platonic basis for a lot of our theology, this is an extraordinary dimension. Uh, and we will see, of course, it's important to us to remember it's a great gift to us, but it's also important to remember that actually it did not perdure in the second millennium. And it's only now we're beginning to again uh, address this and to be enriched by it. I would say it's one of the most important, if not the most important, encyclical in the last 120 years. And um, so it's a huge, uh, for that area, as we will see when we go to look at the, at the, at the compendium of the social teaching of the church, it's only 15 pages. There are 23 pages on human work, for example. There's only a half a paragraph on climate change. This was written in 2004, not in, not in uh, 1901. So there's a huge, huge change, and I think it's very important that we acknowledge that. Another thing, of course, is he addresses this encyclical to everyone, every human being, and it's an addressed as dialogue. He wants a dialogue about what we are doing to planet Earth, what we are doing to the poor, what we are doing uh, to our theological tradition that hasn't taken up the richness of this engagement. So it's a wonderful opening. Uh, uh, so he talks about due to the ill-considered exploitation of nature, humanity runs the risk of destroying it and becoming in turn a victim of this degradation. That the wonderful science and technology which has enhanced all our lives and given us great prosperity, it has a dark side to it and we've been very, we've been very not very careful of that dark side, changing the chemistry of the air, changing the biology of the planet. These are extraordinary things, and he faces us directly with them. Uh, I mean, he wrote, wrote, like people say, did he write it? Nobody but Francis could have written, the earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. Uh, I couldn't see any of the theolog theologians around the table coming up with that. <laughs> so it, it is authentic, and it, and it is extraordinary. And of course, until you begin to think of places that you knew in a period of 40 or 50 years, either the Philippines or in Ireland, that you begin to see how true it is, 
but, it, but none of us would say it. Uh, he reminds Christian that their responsibility within creation and their duty towards nature and the creator are an essential part of their faith. Now, by the way, that comes actually, that's number 64, but it comes from John Paul II's doctor, uh, letter, Peace with God the Creator, Peace with All Creation. And I'll come back to this at the end. Because in that particular document, he gives a lot of real insight and he talks about the need for a catechesis, for actually changing the way we think. And it didn't happen. And unfortunately, unless a catechesis happens, commensurate with the extraordinary changes in this ex uh, encyclical, if someone comes back here 20 years from now, we might have to say the same as we say of the, 2000, of the 1990 document, sorry, nothing happened. What is superb at is connecting the intimate relationship between what is happening to the poor and what is happening to the fragile earth. I mean, over the years, many of us have read an enormous amount of UN documents, which are very good, on climate change, on biodiversity. But there's very few of them that actually captures this extraordinary connection between the impoverishment of people and the degradation of the planet. And, the, and Pope Francis does it with an extraordinary fine touch. Um, so he's convinced a deep communion with the rest of nature cannot be real if our hearts lack tenderness, compassion, and concern for our fellow human beings. And that's number 91. And again, I suppose people like myself, whose faith in a sense was challenged when I went to the Philippines in 1969, challenged by the, the justice com component of the faith. And in the 1970s, when I was introduced to a tribal people who were working up in the tropical forest and saw what was happening to the tropical forest, uh, this is the kind of insight that, that came to me. A concern for the environment thus needs to be joined with a sincere love for fellow human beings and an unwavering commitment to solving the, the problems of society. So both of them go together, the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. And I think anyone who tries to drive a furrow between them is misrepresenting the kinds of things we need to do in this part of the 21st century. The, the document now, which uh, he says is added to the Catholic social teaching, and, and it needed to be, as I say, if you, when you read chapter 10 of the, of the compendium of the social teaching of the church, uh, as we will see, a half a paragraph on climate change, nine paragraphs on biotechnology. What did nine paragraphs on biotechnology work its way into the, into the compendium of the social teachings of the church? I mean, if you had a paragraph on photosynthesis, the great miracle of life, you'd say, well, that's fine. So, now, that to see, I can be compared, I compare it here with three other encyclicals, which I think are quite important. Uh, the first one is the, the first encyclical in 1891, uh, The Rights of Workers. The second one is from uh, Pope John XXIII, The Reality of Nuclear War, at the end of the 1950s and early 1960s. And the third one is with Paul VI's 1967 document, Progressio Populorum on the Progress of People. So let's have a look at those. Modern Catholic social teaching was inaugurated by uh, uh, Pope Leo XIII's Rerum Novarum New Things. Now, of course, for us in Europe, this is 45 years after Karl Marx's critique. So we have always to remember that we're very often slow in catching up with where the world is at a particular time. Uh, he criticized the exploitation of workers, especially those working in factories. Uh, it was clear in Germany, it was beginning to be clear, very clear in, 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 in England with the rise of the Industrial Revolution, but it took a long time for Christians, to be, and Catholics particularly, to begin to see this as part of their social teaching. He contradicts, challenges directly, the, direct, uh, the central thesis of liberal capitalism, that labour is a commodity to be bought at market prices, determined by the laws of supply and demand, rather than by the human needs of the workers number 16, 17, and 33, and 34. So that, in a sense, is the real great insight of uh, Leo XIII. Now, of course, if you read that document right now, and particularly his understanding of governments in terms of authoritarian governments, he had very little problem with them. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire was there. Uh, the Kaiser was in Germany. So, I mean, this insight survives, but certainly the reflection on how society is governed uh, wouldn't do much, we wouldn't get too much from uh, Rerum Novarum. The next one I would talk about, Apachum in Terrace, Peace on Earth with John the 20, Pope John the Twenty Third, 
the reality of the use of nuclear weapons or atomic weapons at the end of World War II, and then when the competing sides of the Cold War got nuclear weapons in the early 1950s, the extraordinary reality that still exists, that we have the power to destroy this planet time and time over and over again. So when the world was teetering at the brink of a nuclear crisis, uh, Pope uh, John XXIII provided a pathway to lasting peace, a concern for lasting peace. Uh, the next one is an important one, the Progressio Populorum, the progress or the development of people by uh, Pope Paul VI. It's a framework for, uh, for understanding what is true development. Because in the 1950s, there were times of great hope, and particularly the 1960s. Uh, President Kennedy talked about putting a man on the moon, but also talked about ending poverty in the world. They did put a man on the moon, but poverty, there's at least tonight 1,200 million people going to bed hungry. So authentic human development hasn't become a reality for the vast majority of people on the planet. So in the 1950s and the 1960s, the pressure was on economic growth, economic growth here in the United States, pulling Europe out of the recession of the, out of World War II. Also then in the early 1960s, uh, Japan and elsewhere. But he began to say, um, what kind of progress are we talking about? Is it just economic progress? And very much he came to, it's a transition from a less human condition to those which are more humane. So there is a moral dimension uh, to this understanding of development. And for example, if you get a society where the, how, the, how, the, how the economic system works, that you end up with a very small minority of very rich people and a huge majority of very poor or middle class people, this certainly is not the true development he talks about. So Laudato Si takes a much, a much wider perspective. It's not just the workers or the poor, but it is actually all creation as well. And it's the first time that an encyclical has, has dealt with that. As we will see, we will look through some of the previous encyclicals, but they didn't deal with creation as, uh, as, as, a, as a unit. There were aspects of it, but very often understood within an economic paradigm and instead of the other way around. So what are some of the previous uh, papal teachings on the environment? Uh, Francis links concern for the poor with the devastation of the earth. And he talks about his, the, the, the teaching of his predecessors. But as Brian said in his introduction, the wonderful thing about Francis from the point of view of ecclesiology is actually he quotes everyone. I think there are 21 quotations from bishops' conferences across the world. And understandably, because these are the places where we're seeing the kind of degradation that's happening to the environment. So he talks about Paul VI, a talk he gave to the Food and Agricultural Organization in Rome uh, about the potential for ecological catastrophe under the effective explosion of industrial culture. Uh, he was very much helped here, as we will see, uh, by an English economist, Barbara Ward. She became Lady Jackson. It was an extraordinary insight. He stressed the urgent need for radical change in the conduct, uh, conduct of humanity. Barbara uh, and Marie de Beau, who was a French microbiologist who worked in Paris and eventually be, uh, worked in, in New York, uh, began to see that human activity was beginning to have a totally deleterious impact on the atmosphere, our air, our water, our soils. And so he called a radical change in the conduct of humanity. Uh, in as much as the most extraordinary scientific advances, the most amazing technical, technical ability, the most uh, astonishing economic growth, unless they're accompanied by a social and moral progress, will definitely turn against humankind. That's the kind of understanding that Barbara Ward was coming out of in the late 50s when she was talking about what was happening across the globe, particularly as countries uh, were getting their freedom from, from the, the European colonists, but she was saying this kind of progress is the only uh, truly authentic progress. And, and th this is quoted by, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Progressio Populorum. Uh, I remember the, 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 um, the first um, Synod of Bishops in uh, uh, 1971 also had some of that Again, because Barbara Ward actually addressed it. 
but in many ways it was lost for the next decade. Uh, the first of uh, Pope uh, John Paul's first encyclical was Redemptor Hominus, uh, the Redemptor of Humankind. And, and he talked about it. We see no other meaning in the natural environment except what it does to serve our human needs because this is the way we were looking at the environment. Everything out there was meant for humankind. Uh, later, in that 1990 document, he called for an, for an ecological conversion. And it's extraordinary and it's central to uh, Pope Francis's understanding of what we need to do as Christian people now not just as Christian people, as people who are standing in front of enormous changes happening to the environment, which will be deleterious to us all. In Centesimus Annus, the hundred years after Rerum Novarum, he came up with this, and Pope Francis incorporates it into his encyclical. And it's very incentive. So his people are saying, OK, we will solve many of these problems by new technologies, which will stop the kind of the destruction that happened with the older technologies. But he's saying that's not enough. We need profound changes in lifestyle. We need profound changes in production. As Francis will make clear in Laudato Si, uh, the natural world, the production reality, are cyclic. What's food for one becomes for, for, for another species. Whereas humans have now have, in their industrial processes, they take from the earth, they mine, whether it's petrochemicals or other, they transform them in their factories operation, often by creating toxic uh, substances. Then they use them for a very short period of time and they throw them away on the waste heap. He said that kind of process has to end. Consum also consumption and also the, the establishment of structures of power which govern our society today. So that's very important to um, to uh, Pope Francis, and he incorporates it into Laudato Si. He also wrote an important document on ecology in 1990. It was called Peace with God the Creator, Peace with All Creation. And what he brought into this was an understanding that the ecological issue was not just ecology as such, or happening to biology, that actually was primarily a moral issue because humans were doing it. The changes that we will see, for example, in the fifth extinction of species happened because a meteoroid hit the planet 65 million years ago. What actually now is hitting the planet is one species with enormous power and pushing other species across the precipice of extinction. Uh, ecological, it also appeared, for example, in Solicitudo Res Socialis. There are three paragraphs there, but again, they're within the context of, of economics and politics. Uh, so, uh, Pope Benedict in Caritas in Veritate, which was in 2009, recognized the natural environment has been greatly damaged by our irresponsible behavior and that the social environment has also suffered damage. But that came out in July 2009. Uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was taking place in Copenhagen that winter, that December. He never mentioned climate change. That's 2009. Uh, by 2015, Francis is telling us climate change is one of the most serious moral issues of the 21st century, with potentially devastating impacts, particularly on the poor. So that's, an ex again, an extraordinary example of the change that took has been taking place. Two years before that, the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace under Cardinal Martino brought a seminar to Rome with three or four climate skeptics from this country. I mean, the Europeans just couldn't believe what was happening. And this is about one of the most serious issues of our time. So uh, while these documents are insightful on social and economic issues, they remain very much human-centered, as if the goods of the planet are just meant for human beings. And one of the big changes that, uh, that Laudato Si attempts to avoid this anthropocentric focus it's a, and in that sense, it's a huge breakthrough in Catholic social teaching. So Laudato Si is the first document that I understand that understands the magnitude of the ecological issue, the structure that's taking place. And that's number one. There's no way you will address a problem unless you know the extent of the problem. And secondly, the urgency with which it must be faced. It's not something that you could put off 
while you're looking at unemployment, while you're looking at housing, we would put off concern for the environment until we get all these things right first. That just, just cannot continue to happen for very obvious reasons. So, as I said, the compendium of the social doctrine of the church, that should be 2004, uh, doesn't contain a sense of the environmental crisis at all. It's chapter 10, for example, of that document. Uh, it's 15 pages, as against 26 pages for on, on, on the chapter on human work. Now, if you look at it in, in, in the geological terms, as you're walking down by your science library, and you're looking from the Cambrian period down 500 million years, so there's 26 pages for human work, and there's only 15 pages or 16 pages for the reality of the planet, which we all depend. Uh, in climate change, you get half a paragraph. In biodiversity, you get half a paragraph. Imagine, in biodiversity, the, without, without other life, we don't have chlorophyll in our ears. We depend on biodiversity for our survival. And then on biotechnology, you get nine paragraphs. I, I was amazed and quite critical of it at the time. As I said, in this document, from an ecclesiological perspective, the Pope, and he did the same in the joy of the gospel, he quotes bishops' conferences. And that's a huge thing. None of, none of the recent popes, Pope John XXIII, Benedict, right back to Leo XIII, that quote the scriptures, that quote the fathers of the church. They wouldn't quote the mothers of the church. Maybe they'll get around to doing that in, in, <laughs> in encyclicals down the road, but they didn't. They'll, cut, they'll quote some of the schoolmen. They'll quote previous popes, and they'll quote themselves. This man quotes a huge other people. And he does it also in, in Evangelii Gaudium. Uh, but the one wonderful thing he does, when he goes to talk about he brings in a person who has an extraordinary record since 1991 when he was elected patriarch of the Greek Orthodox Church and has been going around to the rivers of the world, starting in the Black Sea in the early 1990s, uh, with the death zone in the Black Sea, bringing economists, theologians, scientists, uh, people of faith and prayer to understand what's happening to our world, particularly the seas of our world, and how we can do something to change it. So here we have uh, the moral focus coming from this extraordinary patriarch. And what does he say? For human beings to destroy the biological diversity of God's creation. That's pretty major. And we're doing 100,000 a year. For human beings to degrade the integrity of the earth by causing changes in its climate, by stripping the earth of its natural forests or destroying its wetlands. And we're doing that all over the planet. For human beings to contaminate the earth's water, its land, its air, and its life. So what are they going to say next? We say, well, it's not a good thing. Please don't do it. No. He's going to say, these are sins. Now, here's an extraordinary change. Because I can tell you something. I don't think there's one of us here in this audience tonight that believes this. Now... So this is the kind of catechesis that has to take place, education. We've got to begin to expand our moral imagination to see this is actually hugely immoral behavior. Now, without some real processes of engaging, this will not happen. So that's one of the first extraordinary documents. And he took from, from uh, Bartholomew that he named September 1 as the day of prayer for the care of creation. Again a wonderful gesture of working together with other churches that are already involved in this. Now, one of my criticisms of the document was there was very little uh, understanding of the extraordinary work that the World Council of Churches did uh, on the JPIC program right from the 1970s, right through the 1980s. We were supposed to cooperate, the Catholic Church, at the 1990 World Center of JPIC in Korea in 1990. About six weeks before it happened, the Vatican pulled out. And I won't tell you the reasons, I mean, because you wouldn't believe it. But, but that was our lack of concern. So we called to the Orthodox Church under the patronage to celebrate and pray for creation on that day. The Pope believes that Christians from every tradition are now called to offer their contribution to overcoming the ecological crisis which is facing the planet today. And it calls for a new spirituality and a new moral teaching which previous generations of Christians did not have to deal with. And we've got to start recognizing that as well. For 2,000 years, Christians focused on relationship with God and a relationship with fellow human beings. And that was all. 
Uh, Christians knew it was wrong to worship false gods, to kill, to steal, to commit adultery, or whatever. But very, the majority of Christians never thought it was wrong to devastate the forest, to drain the marshes. Uh, let's talk about the people who plowed up, plowed up the prairies here of North America, the people who cut down the forests in Ireland, who used mercury m mining uh, for uh, purpose in Australia, the people who devastated the tropical forests of the Philippines during the 60s and 70s. Many of these people did not think what they were doing was immoral. They might have thought it was not the best thing to do. Economically, they were paying very little for it. They may have some economic, uh, they might, may have conscience on that, but they would have very little problems. What they were doing was actually wrong. It was only during the past number of decades that we're beginning to see that this is a huge moral issue. But we will have to sh reshape our moral tradition. Uh, I've been a priest for almost 50 years. I never heard a confession where someone came in and said, I've done serious damage. And I lived in areas of the Philippines where enormous damage was being done. So that challenge, that change, will be just enormous. And I, I wouldn't, I, it wouldn't be fair to present it as anything else. And it's only beginning to happen. But it will only happen if there's a good education process that helps it to happen. So Laudato Si is to have a, if it's to have to have a profound, long-lasting influence on Catholic social teaching and ecological, it will need to be followed up with systematic and extensive moral catechesis aimed at bringing about serious changes as they're envisaged in Vatican, or in uh, Laudato Si. So why did he choose uh, Francis? Uh, he's a compelling figure, an extraordinary figure when you look at him in the context of a thousand years of Christianity, and we'll see that in a moment that sense he had of the familial dimension of all creation. Now, he believed, like everyone else, that creatures at the time were all, were all created by, by, by the divine, that he had no understanding of evolution or genetics, but he had this extraordinary understanding of the wonder of creation, the care of the vulnerable, an integral ecology. And I'd just like to call your attention to the fact that right through uh, Laudato Si, Pope Francis uses the term integral ecology. Now he does talk about human ecology, but there, was an extra there is an extraordinary challenge about human ecology. Ecology is the science of the relationship of the biological world with the other world, the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, etc. So this is the world and there are five kingdoms in the biological uh, kingdoms. And one of them is animalia, that's us, uh, and primates and hominids. And then we qualify that with humans. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense uh, in, 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 any, in any proper um, organization of knowledge. But integral ecology is quite different now, and it's central to his understanding of, uh, of, um, of what he presents. So he talks about an inseparable bond between concern for nature, justice for the poor, commitment to society, and interior peace. And that was just wonderful. That's what Francis stood for. And he, the, the, uh, Pope Francis has brought those together in ways that very few other people have done. A bond exemplified by Francis uh, communing with all creation, preaching to the flowers, inviting them to praise God just as, as if they were endowed with reason. Uh, a preaching to the, to, to the birds. Now, we think that's very nice. We, we look, at the, we look at, the, at the paintings of it, but the reality, we think, if somebody here starts preaching to the birds uh, off the campus, uh, I think we might be sending for the men in white, or the women in white coats, that they might come and uh, at least interview the person. The tragedy for actually the Christian tradition is, and in some ways Laudato Si does it, and we will see, but in other ways it doesn't, that actually a lot of that was totally lost in the second millennium. And that's what we have to be honest about what happened. We have to be honest about the history and not pretending some other history took place. And I talk about the antibody, anti-creature sentiment of much of the second millennium. It would be nice to suppose that Francis' vision, especially this fraternal with all creation, continued and blossomed in the century after his death. In fact, it didn't. Uh, the, in fact, the opposite occurred. The creation-centered focus of Francis was lost even among Franciscans, uh, and for a lot of reasons. We say some of the reasons, the hierarchical dualism, uh, the, the, the Platonic world, the, the whole Augustinian world, uh, adopt the, the Hellenistic world, which predated 
uh, Francis by a thousand years. Uh, he was an extraordinary um, per person within that world to have come up with the insights he did. Uh, uh, the influence uh, uh, thought patterns not only to see the world in terms of spirit and matter, but that prize spirit as closer to the divine. And your own great theologian here, Elizabeth Johnson, has been very extraordinary in this uh, in her recent book. And that's a quotation from a, from a talk she gave last, last year in Maynooth. That's the world we were living out of. The late medieval distinction between the natural and supernatural. Naturally, it was... The, it was uh, devised or designed to protect the gratuity of grace, and understandably. But by so focusing on the supernatural, it leached out the present and action of God that was merely natural. And merely natural meant it didn't matter. Uh, the world became no longer a gift. In actual fact, the world just became the stage on which human activity took place, and actually often individual activity, a little bit of the societies there. So it didn't have a dynamic impact on the lives of how people saw they should live. And one of the extraordinary reasons for it, something our tradition hasn't an analyzed, is the reality, the trauma of the Black Death. The Black Death was the most awful thing in Europe in the second millennium. It arrived in 1346, and uh, it had worked its way right across to the town of Kilkenny by 1353. Actually, in the, in, in the capital city of Dublin, something like 16,000 people died during the Black Death. It was an extraordinary uh, pandemic, one of those in, in history. It killed between 75 and 200 million people. In many towns, 70%. In Florence, 60% of the people were dead in eight weeks. So you can imagine the extraordinary reality this was. Um, the, the speed of its transit, vast numbers of people died. It sparked a series of religious and social and economic upheavals, which had a profound impact on Euro European history and spirituality and theology. Like other things, and I can talk about the, the Irish famine in the 1940s, the clergy were excellent during the famine. But if you begin to look at the texts of the, 1950, of the 1850s, they're beginning to say, oh, why did this happen? It's God's punishment for a people who were not living by the Christian way. And that's exactly what happened after the Black Death. A spiritual, if we, the only protection open to humankind against this extraordinary event was a spirituality based on prayer, asceticism, mortification, and withdrawal from engagement with the world. If you really wanted to make your soul, that's the way you did it. And getting into politics or getting elsewhere and creation had no value, whatever. This was added to in, by, in, in, in the Reformation. Extraordinary. It wasn't the reason for the Reformation, but the exclusive almost focus on human salvation, that everything else didn't actually matter at all. Uh, within our, uh, the negative attitude to, was, was present in the, the Missal of uh, uh, Pope Pius V, which was, was in use right up to Vatican II. Uh, I remember in, being in the seminary, the post-communion prayer during Advent was, Oremus dotius nos terrena dispicere, et amare celestia. Teach us to despise the things of earth and to love the things of heaven. And for where we come from, lex orandi, lex credendi, the way you pray is the way you believe and the way you act. So that's the kind of world we came out of. And I think it's important we remember. It was even in, 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 in the Salva Regina, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Did you ever come to the burn and the wonderful beauty of the biodiversity there? The allurement of nature. So all that allurement was lost. Actually, it was seen as possibly dangerous and to be avoided. In our own tradition, uh, the, the Janssen world, again, pouring extraordinary levels of Augustinian reality and guilt, paid little attention to creation uh, uh, in the life of the believer. Actually, none. It was focused on original sin, human depravity, uh, predestination. It was condemned, but in many ways, it worked its way into a lot of how people understood the Catholic Christian faith at the time. So these influenced together, an antibody, other um, uh, creature bias, dominated the spiritual life and spiritual literature. In religious houses of formation, this was right up until the point of the Second Vatican Council. Spirituality gave priority to the salvation of your soul, the future life in heaven, rather than any involvement with the natural world itself. We were told our true home is in heaven. 
So if your true home is in heaven, you really don't have to do much about what is here. It was so prevalent that Pope uh, John XXIII had to remind Catholics that the laity must not suppose they would be acting prudently to lessen their Christian commitment to this passing world. On the contrary, he insists we must intensify and increase its uh, continuity. Let no one suppose that a life of activity in the world is incompatible with their spiritual perfection. That had to be said in 1961. So that's the kind of position we were coming out of. Now, not everyone believed in that. Uh, in the encyclical himself, he quotes uh, from, John, um, uh, from uh, John of the Cross, the mountains have heights, they are plentiful, vast, beautiful, graceful, bright, fragrant. These mountains are what my beloved is to me. But he was a fairly lone voice, even uh, people who lived at his time. And I'm not knocking uh, Teresa of Avila and her extraordinary understanding of spirituality, but listen to what she said. The creatures are only the crumbs that fall from God's table, and none but the dogs will pick them up. So when we begin to think of spirit, a spiritual of the P.S. as Moderna in those years of the 15th century onwards, we have to understand the cultural context in which it took place, and that it's not available to us today, that a spirituality and a mysticism has to actually begin to take place from the, the, the action of the world around us. And, and Laudato Si is great on this. Many Christians, in the sec, especially in the second millennium, had a much more jaundiced view uh, and did not always respect the earth. Pope Francis acknowledges this. Uh, if a mistaken understanding of our principles has a time led us to justify mistreating la, la, uh, nature, he says that, exercise tyranny, talks about tyranny over creation, engage in war, injustice, and acts of violence. He, ex he, he says that actually has taken place. We believers should acknowledge that we are doing was not faithful to the wisdom, treasure of wisdom which we had been called to protect and preserve. That's number uh, 200. And when we went back to Genesis, how did we look at Genesis? Our theology, he develops his own theology uh, from the quotations in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. He begins by reviewing the creation stories from uh, Genesis, finding there an affirmation of the goodness of this world, uh, which not every culture in the Middle East taught at the time. Many thought that there was an equally strong evil process. Certainly is Israel did not believe in that. The world was created by a loving God, and it was good. And that's what we see in the first uh, book of Genesis. Uh, it was very good. Uh, God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good indeed. So, God's creative outpouring reaches its zenith in the creation of human beings, of man and woman. So let us make man in our own image and likeness, and let them be masters of the fish, the sea, birds of the air, the cattle, all wild beasts and reptiles that crawl on the earth. God blessed them, saying to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and conquer it. Now that's the reality. But he says, no, the, the repercussions of this command to fill the earth and conquer it have to be seen the way the Christians and Jews have related to the natural world. That's what we do. We go out and conquer the world. We subdue it. And we don't think that it is sinful. This is what, what the, having dominion over, over crea uh, creation means. Pope Francis is aware that Genesis account, which grants humans dominion over the earth, has encouraged unbridled exploitation of nature by painting him as domineering and destructive by nature. That's number 67. And then he says very clearly, this is not a proper interpretation of that side of Genesis. Now, of course, if he went back to uh, Progressive Populorum, that's the way Progressive Populorum understood uh, Genesis chapter 1. So he brings us into Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, where Adam was to till and keep the world and the garden, tilling... Uh, was cultivating, but the keeping was caring and protecting and overseeing. So it's an effort to, in a sense, uh, have a new hermeneutic on that area of Genesis. But the Pope, this text calls humans to be thoughtful and creative, careful in the way they relate to creation. Though he does admit, yes, it is true that we Christians have at times incorrectly interpreted the scriptures. Uh, nowadays, we must forcibly reject the notion that our being created in God's image and given dominion over the earth justifies absolute dominion over other creatures. 
And this is something he will come, come on to in a few moments when he talks about biodiversity. The Pope joins with modern biblical scholars who insist that the divine command in Genesis cannot be interpreted as a license from humans to transform the earth with our whim or fancy. And that's true. But the reality, if we go and ask ourselves, the dominion given in Genesis chapter 1 verse 8 uh, challenges us to imitate God's loving kindness and his faithfulness. And we are to be kind of viceroys in relationship to the non-human. Uh, like viceroys, uh, we are expected to be just and honest in the way we deliver our services, and we're forbidden to exploit the earth or other people. So that's the way we're now expected. And he comes, of course, when you read Genesis chapter 1, it doesn't end with the creation of humans. It ends with the creation of the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was a very important institution, not just for humans, but for all creation as well. And it was a way which every society needs of redistributing the goods and the wealth of a nation. Otherwise, all the wealth, or a lot of the wealth, will accrue just to the very wealthy. But is that the way Genesis was understood since the 16th century? And there you don't go to theologians. You don't go to biblical scholars, you go to historians. And then the historians tell us that wasn't the way. Although uh, scripture scholars and the Pope said, um, this is the way we need now to interpret scripture. Uh, from Tudor times on, it wasn't interpreted this way. And uh, uh, Keith Thomas, who's, uh, whose book is a historian in Oxford uh, of uh, human relationship with the natural world, a history of modern sensibility. Nature made nothing in vain, said Aristotle, and everything had a purpose. Plants were created for the sake of animals, animals for the sake of, 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 men, of man. Domestic animals were there to labor and wild ones to be hunted. The Stoics are taught the same. Nature existed solely to serve man's interest. So that's something we have to totally disengage ourselves from. Uh, this anthropocentric, mechanistic world was added to and built on by people like Francis Bacon, by the mechanistic world of people like Isaac uh, Newton, and by the world of mathematics that really considered the natural world had really very little place. As René Descartes says, man stood to animals as did heaven to earth, soul to body, and culture to nature. So you weren't really taking seriously the natural world around you. This was a total qualitative difference between humankind and all of nature. Aware of this history, uh, Francis points out the unhealthy dualism, which has left a mark on certain Christian thinkers and has disfigured the gospel and also has disfigured the earth. And he said that's the context in which someone like James Watt in, in 1750 began the, the, the technological revolution which has marked our era. Uh, Today, many scientists believe that processes unleashed by what, by what have had an extraordinary impact on the planet. Uh, two, third, two and a half centuries later, we've been stewing, uh, spewing out carbon monoxide. We have changed the very chemistry of the air. For, for 10,000 years, there was 280 parts per million of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. There's now 406, with the implications of that, of, the, of, uh, of climate change that we are seeing. And climate change is something the Pope took very seriously. There was all kinds of questions. Would he actually put in a maybe? Would he, in, 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 in a sense, kind of back off? And he didn't. Uh, he says in number 23, there's a solid scientific consensus in the case that we are presently witnessing a disturbing warming of the climate system. No ifs, no buts, the intergovernmental panel on climate change, all of them. And he says humans are mainly responsible. And he goes on to list the greenhouse gases. So uh, he, make, he, he accepts the scientific consensus that climate change is happening, that humans are generating, and that uh, greenhouse gases are causing these changes. Of course, he's very strong that the poor will suffer most. And we know that very well. Uh, the people who live, for example, in Lima, if they have no water in 10 or 20 years from now, there's 9 million people. What are we going to do with, it, with them? Uh, the... the so the encyclical just doesn't deal with, with, uh, with climate change. It deals also with poverty. It deals also with extraordinary destruction of biodiversity, uh, the pollution of fresh water on the oceans. Not enough on the oceans. The oceans are 71% of our planet. If you were out in space and looking down at planet Earth, you'd see oceans, not Earth. But uh, we have 
I often say World War II ended uh, in 1945, except in the oceans, because we brought all the technologies we had that we had used against our enemies, and we put them against the oceans, where life began. And life was in the oceans for three billion years before it ever came into land. Sustainable food and the extractive industries and waste. Now, you can't go into all of those, and I won't. I'll just finish in this area the reality of extinction. Life is extraordinarily old. It's at least 3.8 billion years old. It's phenomenal. Life developed the, the ability to use the, rate, to, to use the sun uh, to create food and to create the oxygen that we need. An extraordinary reality for life. The Earth's resources that have been plundered by short-term approaches to the economy, commerce, and production. That's his first reflection on, on destruction of species. What is now happening is comparable to the extinction event which wiped out the dinosaurs. 65 million years, an asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula. It wasn't then where it is now, because the Americas were divided with plate tectonics, but it, it destroyed these species. It allowed us. We were furry and nocturnal creatures. Otherwise, we'd been picked up by one of these di dinosaurs. And we evolved, and, and primates evolved, and other mammals evolved. Uh, so, the Pope talks about 100,000 species. I believe we should, in our, in our liturgies, we should, we sh this should be part of our liturgies, the destruction of species. Because they're gone, they're gone forever. There's no way back. There's maybe some way back with genetics engineering, but for 100,000 species, they're not. And the web of life, the tree of life is interconnected. Extinction rate is up 100 times higher than it would have been without human activity. There's a conservative, look at the species that have been, that have been lost that we even know of. And that wonderful uh, biologist, Harvard biologist, he's retired now, uh, E.O. Wilson, the quenching of the life's exuberance will be uh, more consequential to humanity than all present day warming, ozone depletion, and pollution uh, combined. But we, don't, we haven't taken that seriously. Uh, so what I'm basically saying is, I think we need, I would suggest a three-year program for a synod on ecology. Uh, the first year of the program would be to try to understand and relate to the natural world we know. Uh, the local parish, the environment. What are the flora and fauna there? Uh, you'd also begin to look at the, how the ecosystem's been treated and impacted. Would you be growing lawns here 25 years from now? Lawns are, were, they were for the upper class in Britain in the 17th, 18th century. They're an extraordinary thing that the Europeans sent right around the world and totally inappropriate in most parts of the world. The, all the use they have is they, we spend fossil fuel cutting them uh, and trying to get rid of them. Uh, so this understanding, so you would have people with these knowledge of climate change, of biodiversity as part of... Um, uh, People who are skilled in these areas calls to share their expertise with members of the Senate. Mostly should be, should be lay people. Uh, uh, it's important to have an important uh, a mix of age at the, at the... So I'll ask some of the questions out of, out of uh, Laudato Si. How do we deal with greenhouse gas emissions? So every country... I mean, what happened in Paris was, was wonderful. Countries there, they made their own commitments what they would do. But in 2009, said we cannot allow the average global temperature to rise more than two degrees above what it was in the pre-industrial level. Coming out of Paris, we're heading for four degrees. What four degrees would do biologically, it would create a new geological era. So you would be adding to your geological eras outside your science lab, you would be adding the Anthropocene, that in two centuries, for example, the Anthropocene would change the tropical rainforest of the Amazon into savanna land within 100 or 150 years. That would be, that's the kind of change. Like the last ice age, the temperature was 3 to 4 degrees Celsius lower than it is now. So it doesn't need huge levels of change. For example, can we still continue to eat meat the way we eat it? Best studies say a very strong meat diet you can feed about 2 billion people. By 2050, we'll have 10 billion people. So is this 
a moral issue. Uh, so, we would also uh, change, uh, if this was to take place, obviously we'd have to uh, talk about alternative farming, suggesting and supporting the farming community. But these are the kind of issues that the, that the world is going to have to face. Uh, the use of energy, use of water, and the use of our waste. But we will also need to develop a spirituality. We will also need to have developed new liturgies that honor our relationship with God, with fellow human beings, and with all creation. Appropriate liturgies to tease out what the new and harmonious way of living might entail. So the second year and third year, we would have that at a national level. For example, if inland uh, counties or states, you wouldn't be talking about the oceans. But we need to talk about the oceans. And so that would happen at a national level and then at an international level. And I think it would be a great service, not just to the church, but it would be a great service to the world. This would be a huge ecological boost to, ecolog uh, boost to ecological thinking and action around the world, and the Catholic Church could play a vital role as a catalyst for facilitating the whole process. But if you ask me, you know, this is a great encyclical in terms of climate change, in terms of biodiversity, uh, it talks about every species has intrinsic value. This is new teaching. So it's telling us we cannot live our world and not be aware of the acclaim that other species are asking for us. So if we're walking around the university here, we will have before in front of trees. What is this tree? Like is it an, an oak tree that supports 400 other species in the place I live in Ireland? So as it's asking us to change our moral framework, it's also asking us to change our spirituality. That we are no longer the, own, the only species treading through the world with not a concern for anyone else. And he goes through that in extraordinary detail. It was one of the areas that, in my own involvement, this was nearly not going to happen. And it is just extraordinary. But the final thing I'd say is, if you say, what is this extraordinary document? Actually, it's an evangelical document. He says, every creature is thus the object of the Father's tenderness who gives us its place in the world. Christians in their turn realize that their responsibility within creation, that their duties towards the Creator are an essential part of their faith. And next to that, sec two on, human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships with God, with the neighbor, and with the earth itself. Thank you. Questions. Rory's got one here. Questions from the audience? <coughs> Rory, you want to come up here? <sighs> Use this for the response. Yes. Uh, my question is what are your views of the position of the U.S. Catholic bishops on this issue? thinking specifically of where they've been in the last uh, well, eight years ago uh, regarding the uh, election at that time. Uh, uh, the single issue at that time seemed to be abortion and there was nothing else on the table. And do you perceive that there's going to be a change? If not, what can we do to help facilitate a change? I think you would understand if, you know, I don't live here. Uh, now, he actually mentions, one of the, one of the quotations he mentions in the, in the encyclical is actually the position of the Catholic bishops on the impact of ecological destruction on the poor. So it's an extraordinarily powerful thing. Uh, you see, and I think it's part of, uh, of Pope Francis, all of us need to be evangelized. You know, the, the, we're not talking about evangelizing the laity, we're talking about evangelizing the church. And he talks very strongly about the whole clerical world in the church and clericalism. And I can understand one of the reasons I talk about a synodal process and my own experience, I talk about the Irish bishops because I've been at home in Ireland. You see, why won't bishops be 
be, why do bishops find it impossible to get into this? Because they don't have the language. So they begin to talk about climate change and they say, oh, um, now the, 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 um, the carbon, uh, carbon, uh, carbon monoxide, <laughs> you know, and that's it. Now, to be fair to us, we can't expect them. So that's why I am very strong on the synodal process and not directed by the hierarchy one people in the church, but directed by the fact, and, and the, the Pope, not just on this, is very strong on, that's the way the church should work. And particularly people who have expertise in this area, expertise both on the science and the theology and spirituality, need to have their voices heard. And uh, I mean, your country, I mean, you just think of the extreme weather events in your country for the last five to six years, and we're still in denial, a party of the, you're of, is still in denial about climate change. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, but it's also awful, because if you're in denial, you're not going to actually take it up and do something about it. So um, I hope that kind of answers your question without getting too much into the, the local... Because, quite frankly, I don't know. I mean, some, some of you would have much better ideas on that than I have. The mic's coming around. First, Father, thank you very much for your presentation. My question is, how can you, by the way, I am from the Philippines, so I can relate with all of the things that you say. Um, how can you draw the balance of uh, for example, we uh, every single day there are babies being born, and then uh, so they need resources. Human, 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 humanity needs yeah. resources. And then, for example, with regards to plants, uh, to trees, so we we need they, we need to cut trees in order to build houses. And the solution is replant, replant, mm -hmm. plant trees, plant trees. But uh, every hour, there are a lot of babies being born in this world that need to eat, and trees needs like many, many years for these trees to 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 grow big and to be utilized as as another house. So how can you draw that particular balance of a certain need of uh, of a human person towards the of course taking care of our mother? Well, I actually think you, you, like the whole reality of the future has to be sustainable development, you know. And I actually think we have to begin to look at the reality of human population levels. I mean, when the Spaniards left your country, it left the Philippines, in 1898, there were six and a half million people. There's now 105. And by the way, when the Spaniards left all the ecosystems, more or less, except maybe around Manila and Cebu, were were alive, the, the five forests of the Philippines, particularly the Dipteracar forest, they were all there. The coral, coral reefs and mangroves were extraordinarily uh, productive at that time. The topsoil was there. See, when we talk about the Philippines, for example, the Haiyan in 2013, the, the largest storm in human history, uh, we talk about six, six and a half million, uh, six and a half thousand people were killed. What we don't say is tens of millions of tons of topsoil ended up where it shouldn't be, in the ocean. So I think we have to begin. And in my book, Laudato Si, now to be fair to the, the Pope, he, he talks about, about uh, population, and, but then he comes back and says there are serious issues. And if you look at the profile of Nigeria's population at the moment that could triple in 60 to 70 years, like it did in the Philippines, I think you're looking for enormous destruction in the future. So we have a, we have a responsibility, I think, to begin to take this thing seriously. And uh, I mean, I saw the end of the tropical forest. And that's gone forever in the Philippines, and all that biodiversity. I, like, I come from Ireland, and people often say it's a wonderful, oh, gorgeous country. Actually, we are paupers when it comes to biodiversity. We have only 20 species of trees that are indigenous to Ireland. Before I left the Philippines uh, from working in Lake Cebu, because uh, I got a, quite a bit of money from the Australian government. Now, at that stage, you could never go to a Catholic agency to ask for money for reforestation. They would look at you. 
You could go and ask for schools. You could go and ask for clinics. You could go and ask for to build up uh, uh, people work situation, but you could never. I, I want to. Uh, but I remember a group of uh, a group of Filipino and um, Australian uh, biologists, entomologists came to, to Lake Cebu for about five weeks. And in one hectare alone, they found 120 species of trees. I mean, that was the wonder of the Philippines. The tragedy is gone. And I hate saying this, but be, because we don't listen, we talk economic terms that make no sense in terms of the destruction of habitat. And as I say, when we, when we look at, at destruction like high end, we look at the number of houses knocked down and, that's, and the number of people who lost it, and I'm not denying that. But we don't look at underneath it. Uh, will there be any soil left for topsoil? Like the Philippines is a country, from the perspective of sustainable agriculture, it needs 50% forest cover. If, that's, if you don't have that, you won't have sustainable agriculture. And all the money you put into, uh, into uh, uh, various kinds of agriculture just won't pay off. But that's not the way we think. Francis in Laudapati and he repeated his call for uh, a new spirituality, mm. um, a different spirituality that's connected to our fellow creatures. Um, spirituality is a sort of notoriously fuzzy, yeah. uh, squishy word uh, that needs definition. So I wonder if you might commend two or three practices of that would make up a spirituality of interconnection to other creatures. Mm. How, what might that spirituality look like tomorrow morning or, or next mm. week? Okay, uh, a very good question. Yeah, I think it's a question that uh, I about when I came back to, the, to Ireland, I began to organise a part-time MA in ecology and religion. And one of the things we did a week every year. Uh, in various parts of the country, we did it in a place called the Burn, which is lower Carboniferous. So it actually begins starting with the rocks. Like, what we are challenged to know is our world. Uh, the rocks that are underneath you, they tell you what you can actually do with land, whether it's going to be productive or not. Then it has to do with, with the profusion of other creatures, trees, flowers, uh, wheat, things we use for, for, for sustaining our own lives. So that's the heart and of a new spirituality, aware of the allure of every one of those species that is asking us for a claim, which we've never given a claim to. So without that, you won't have, so, I mean, people go out, we, they bring in flowers they can bring in, they look at the morphology under, under microscopes, they're actually coming to an intimate understanding of the nature of life around them. I'm not asking them to be biologists, but I am asking them that they would, if they, if they say they want to respect the life around them, you won't respect if you don't even know the name of what, what's around you. And think of Genesis chapter 3, where God brought all the animals before, before Adam and asked, them, asked Adam to name them. So I think, Adam, that whole area would be the beginning of a very good spirituality of nature. And the wonderful thing about it, it it's open-ended. One of the things that, that for me almost killed theology when I was in the seminary, as I, I got the feel that it was all said before. Some wise, wise man had said everything before. The heart of theology and spirituality is it's open. And it's open to be continually renewed and... Uh, and, uh, and um, and appreciate it. So, and then you see the, the whole point of it, it would be, in the whole area of enculturated theology, every area would be different. The rocks, the Devonian rocks are very different from Carboniferous rocks. And we do need spiritualities that are, that, and certainly in Laudato Si, but, but also in the joy of the gospel, the Pope was talking about the real need for true enculturation. Well, that, for me, starts with the rocks up. And, and also spiritualities, uh, a whole area of pilgrims, 
You know, the whole natural world is a pilgrim reality as in itself, and to lock into that. And to a certain extent, it was in the Irish Christian tradition from about the 7th century onwards. A real sense of, of, of commitment to nature and seeing God in creation. Unfortunately, very often at that, we saw creation as an allurement that might be leading us astray. And I think that, that's not the way Laudato Si would ask us to go. I hope I gave you some understanding there. Oh well, yes, thank you very much for your, I consider very, a very complex uh, subject in terms of my, very interesting. My question to you is this, because you mentioned a few broad scriptures. My part in my research and this whole thing, my travel, my friend, we look straight to South America, where we still have 21 tribes living. Few people know this, they're totally with nature. Very little discussed, very little talked about. But my question is this, is there really no scripture, especially from the perspective of Christians? We have only difficulty. How do you stop the reality of our sin that we constantly want the wants over the need? We are too much in a society where we are basically yielding the need. Constantly in order for what we have accomplished and what we want. Mm. And everything we want has to do with the environmental impact. If we travel the story that I've done for the last 20, 30 years, mm. we don't want to pick this up. But look the way we like to live right now. Mm. I wonder that a lot of people want to give that up. As long as we don't want to give this up and repent, mm. I think, you know, you're talking about nice philosophy, but it won't get nowhere. The chapter in the Bible, especially in the book of Matthew, will tell us that. Mm. So far, I believe we have not learned a little bit from mm. history. And we, and we continue this path with quote unquote technology, mm. comfort, I think. And I think you're absolutely right. It has to come from our, mm. from the pulpit to begin with. I sincerely believe that. If we really want to about the balance of mm. nature mm. and humans. Thanks. And I, I believe that. So. But anyhow, okay. thank you for uh, your presentation. Uh, yeah, I take that as very true. And Pope Francis is very strong on the number one problem, particularly facing people in OECD countries like, ours, that, like this country here, is consumerism. Uh, Consumerism, he sees, as a very, very negative reality. It's, it's, uh, it succeeds because of extraordinary advertising that tries to identify the weak spot in everyone. And that tells you if you have what they're offering, somehow or another, you will be whole. You'll have the salvation that you need in theological terms. And that has done enormous damage. The other thing, you remember where he talked about structures of government that begin to, in, to take seriously. The reality of what happened in this country in the 1920s uh, was planned obsolescence. Uh, things were created so they wouldn't last. And so we have this extraordinary reality of taking from the earth and destroying the earth and poisoning the earth. And we've awful things to think about. The placenta of every baby born in the United States has between 100 and 120 different toxic substances because of the way we have lived. Now, that doesn't say great for the future. So we had this planned obsolescence. Uh, so we take it out of the ground, we create something, and we use it for a very short period of time. And then we throw it away into the rubbish it possibly ends up in the oceans. Uh, the plastic will kill multiple species of, of, of marine life. And we think this is the way to live. So he's actually talking about a massive change in this, that we have to begin to develop industrial processes that mimic nature, that are cyclic. They are possible. There are a couple of extraordinary engineers here in this country who are talking about that area. But we need to get it into the public world. 
and we need to get it. Because the one thing we have to be absolutely clear on is, if we do nothing, it will be awful. We are not talking about, ah, well, maybe we did a good thing, we'd be, you know, we'll, we'll feel good about ourselves, and that's it. No, I mean, we know on climate change, if, if, if there's a four degree Celsius rise by 2080, you're talking about a new geological era. And if you go up outside the library, the Carboniferous period, the lower Carboniferous, upper, upper Carboniferous, is 50 million years. The Cretaceous period is 65 million years. And we're now talking about bringing about a change in two centuries that is irreversible. That's what we're talking about. And so the last thing is, and he's very strong on it in, I think, chapter four, that tech, we have been seduced by technologies that someone is going to invent a technology that's going to solve all these issues. And he's saying, that's nonsense. In actual fact, in many situations, they, they make it worse. So those are three areas that I think the Christian church, somebody asked me about the bishop, the Christian churches, these are as serious issues as some of the other issues they've been talking about. And they're very serious for a sustaining, sustain, sustaining a society into the future. And this country, you gave the lead in planned obsolescence in the 1920s. Uh, and I think we need to completely change that. And it's doable. There are all kinds of new technologies at the moment that, that actually could change it, but they need to come into the, that public world and be central to it rather than on the periphery. recently and um, I just spent the last year backpacking around the world mostly to second and third world countries and noticed that um, people who had been using banana leaf previously to package their, fo their food or other things are now using plastic bags yeah. from China and um, they don't realize the impact that it has mm. not only on their kind of future yeah. life or their earth or their beach but mm. the fish that they're going to eat yeah. tomorrow yeah. or the rice that's in their rice field in yeah. front of them. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, um, I looked while you were speaking on Wiki about, you know, what was it in 1970 with Earth Day that had such a huge impact and effect across the world? Like, how do we get that momentum? How do we, how do we re-energize that momentum that existed in mm -hmm. the 70s? What can we do yeah. to, to re-energize it and to, to, mm -hmm. to express that interconnectivity? Well, I suppose we have to know what's going on, you know? And we have to know the powers that are for us and against us. You know, the biggest change in, in the reality of economic life in the last 60 years is the power of corporate capitalism. If you got 100 institutions in 1946, uh, economic institutions, and you say, which are the most powerful? All of them except two or three were countries. I think General Motors was one. And, um, one other American company. Now, for, now 64, 65 of them are. And they're so powerful that they can do all kinds of things. Uh, and governments are not even, like we have a situation in Ireland with Facebook because they work their way through the system for Europe called the double Irish. They're supposed to be between they're paying 12.5% in terms of corporate tax, which is nothing. But in actual fact, they're, they're, they're presenting about 2% because they're going through and Chile, various offshore accounts of Holland. But the Irish government doesn't want the money back because they're afraid that the, the next corporate company won't do business there. So we need to be aware of, like certainly, you know, in, in the area of climate change, I mean, one of the reasons why one of your parties is totally, is because the power of the petrochemical industry here. And there's no, if we say it, otherwise, it's just foolish. You just look at where they, they put their money. These people who came to the Vatican in 2007, when you look at where they got their money, they got their money from, 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 from oil companies. So, and the same is true of, of, of almost everything else, and particularly in the area of food, the way food is produced. So yeah, the interconnectedness is hugely important, but I suppose one of the things I'd like to keep emphasizing is that as Coming out of Laudato Si, I mean, this is an extraordinary document. The science of it is excellent. 
but it is a religious and spiritual document as well. Not spiritual in way off up in the clouds, uh, the, 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 the vested from everything in, like, like, like the Platonist world, but there's a real religious insight about concern for the other, be the other, the poor of the world, are now, uh, are now creation. And, and I agree with you. So the same is true of plastics. I mean, you, my generation remembers the creation of plastic. So I'm 72 years of age, so I know. And when we look out at that extraordinary plastic thing in the, the central Pacific, that happened in my lifetime. Now, can we change that? I think we can. But we will only change it if we give prominence to, to trying to do new things and to critiquing the things that are stopping us to do it. And then, as religious, to theology. To, what does this mean for us in the context of God's gift of creation? I mean, the, the least central issue of theology is the giftlessness of life. We kind of waited for almost the end of theology. But that's, and the giftedness of sustainable life into the future is surely what everyone should be trying to do. Thank you again. So my question has to do with technology. Uh, you said that it, it might not be the, uh, I guess, the forefront of, it should not be completely on the forefront of our minds, but do you think technology in this day and age is a, a method for, at least in getting a message across, or getting a message of, mm. of what you're talking about across? How can we use technology in this day and age to get the spirituality and uh, this new, mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and mm. emerging, uh, emerging markets connectivity is very important. Sure. Companies like Facebook are focused on mm. that. Sure. Um, but how do we spread that message mm. across? Well, one of the ways would be, of course, planned obsolescence. You know, I should be able to do with my 2006 phone until maybe I, 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 I reach my 75th year. Um, but one of, we have also, we're, we have benefited enormously from an, our understanding of modern science as a religious people. You know, when about in 1630, there was a, a very bright Irish uh, archbishop. He was Church of Ireland, a guy called James Usher. And he, he, he was very good at Hebrew and other things. He, he, he got down there, uh, Methuselah. How old was Methuselah? He was nine, 990, yeah, so. Anyway, he worked out that the world began on the 23rd of October, 4004 BC. And everyone laughs. Now, I talked to you about Isaac Newton, who was the generation after him. He had, a, a, he had there was about four years extra. It was 4008. Now, we know that this world of ours is 4.7 billion years. It's an extraordinary reality, and we're part of it. Our life is part of it. Tycho Brahe was one of the last astronomers, if we might call him, that looked at the stars without a telescope. And he did it for many nights. And he was an irascible old chap, the, the chap beside him. He had worked out that there was 817 stars in the heavens. Maybe 818 or 20. If he went over that, he'd really get at you. We know there's 400 billion in the Milky Way alone, and there's a billion. So we actually have an extraordinary, this is revelatory, this is a revelation, because the response to it is awe and respect. Now, that's what we have to bring into our technologies, that the technologies respect the reality of human well-being, doesn't oppress them, but also the well-being of the Earth. And that's all possible.